Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beth Howard. We're going to do a Bible study. We're switching from the New Testament in Thessalonians to the Old Testament. We're going to be this quarter in 1st and 2nd Kings. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, it's just Kings. It's a history book about the kings of Israel. So, but we've split it into two books for some reason. Session one, the title of the lesson is called Granted. We're going to be studying that famous story of Solomon asking God for wisdom. You can find it in chapter three, verses four through 15. Wisdom, the, God is gonna grant Solomon his request for wisdom and the definition of wisdom, according to the dictionary, is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. All three woven together. It's not, it's not enough to have good knowledge and good judgment. You also have to have experience, according to this definition. We're going to see how that plays out in the scripture today. So let me do a little background of where we are and, and why the book is there. The Old Testament has a group of books called history books, and they, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, and the history books come after the first five books, which we call the law. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. The history books start with Joshua and go through Esther, followed by the wisdom books, which are, for the most part are uh, written by Solomon, and the poetry, which is Solomon and King David writing uh, about the Psalms. Uh, that's Job through the Song of Songs. And then the prophets, and we just finished studying a few uh, a quarter back, uh, Ezekiel and Daniel, and the, it goes from Isaiah through Malachi, the major prophets and the minor prophets, basically the size of the book that's, that you're looking at. That's how it's ranked. <clears throat> so... Let's take a little closer look at the history books, Joshua through Esther. It covers a period in Israel's history of about 825 years. It begins with the entrance of the Israelites into the promised land. Remember when Moses took them up to the entrance of the land and they said, oh, we're afraid. And so they wandered for 40 years. Well, that's also history. But the history that we're talking about here is going to start after they cross the Jordan River, and they go into the Promised Land. And it ends with the exile of both the Northern Kingdom, Israel, and the Southern Kingdom, Judah. And we, we just finished studying a quarter ago that in Daniel and Ezekiel. And uh, it, it, the final part of the history books ends with their temporary return in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But we know that that was only a temporary return because then they were dispersed again by the Romans after uh, 70 years after Jesus was crucified. And so, uh, but there's a lot of promise in these history books of a time when they will be restored forever. And we know <laughs> that that will be the reign of Christ, yes. a thousand years reign. Okay, now, as you might expect, throughout these history books, there is a little redundancy. And it's, as you know, in the New Testament, we have the four gospels and those four gospels tell one story, the story of the life of Christ. But they tell that story, the synoptic three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell it from one direction. And John comes at it from a little different direction, but there are four different perspectives on the life of Christ to give us a more rich, more full view of the life of Christ. Well, the Old Testament history books are no different they give us sometimes the exact same event from two different perspectives. And Joshua through 2 Kings, those books were written prior to the exile, and they're primarily focused on the things that the Israelites did <clears throat> that resulted in God's judgment, which resulted in the ex or which manifested itself in the exile. However, 1 and 2 Chronicles, which deal with a lot of the same events, those two books were written post-exile, and as a result, they are focused more on the part of this about Judah's restoration. So same events, different perspective. One perspective talks about how they got there. The other perspective is talks about how God is going to redeem them back. So very interesting. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we've got one verse coming from a parallel story uh, in today's lesson. But today's lesson is really a very familiar story about how God grants uh, Solomon wisdom. So let's get started. 
And it starts in chapter 3, but you need to know that in chapters 1 and 2, mm -hmm. Solomon didn't become king just really easily. Uh, matter of fact, as David was dying, uh, his oldest living son, Adonijah, uh, assumed that he was going to be king and set himself up with this great party to celebrate him being the new king. And when Nathan the prophet found out, he went to Bathsheba because they both, Nathan and Bathsheba, both knew that David had promised the throne to Solomon, Bathsheba's second son. So they, Nathan got all upset and said, David, we've got to anoint Solomon right now uh, so that this doesn't go any further. So they did. So now we're a little further along in the story. Solomon has secured the throne and now we're off and running. The king the be Solomon went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for Gibeon was the most important high place. There were a lot of high places where God was worshiped because at that point there was no, uh, no uh, temple. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, Solomon went to the highest of the high places and Solomon offered there uh, at the, the altar that was on that high place, a thousand burnt offerings. Wow. A lot awesome. of burnt offerings. So, so he is really uh, celebrating uh, God's provision uh, of him becoming king. <clears throat> Verse 5, uh, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said to Solomon, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now, this sounds like a lot of the whole stories about, uh, you know, you found a bottle, a uh, genie. genie in a bottle, and you rub the bottle, and the genie comes out and says, you know, I'll grant you three wishes. Well, you know, it sounds awkwardly like that because God just tells Solomon, whatever you want, just ask me. It was a test. Mm -hmm. That's plain and simple. God was testing Solomon right off the bat. And then Solomon answered in verse 6, and he's talking to God, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was number one, faithful to you. And, and David was faithful to God through most of his life. He had failures like we all do, but uh, he was faithful. As a matter of fact, God said, this is a man after my own heart. Okay, so he was both faithful to you and he was righteous and upright in heart. So for the most part, he was upright in heart. So he says, you have shown great kindness because of that. And then you have continued this great kindness to my father, David, and have given him a son, that would be me, Solomon, to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. And then he says this, <clears throat> I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Now, he wasn't a little child, wasn't a little child in terms of being 10 or 12. Uh, most of the commentaries, and they do a great job of telling you how they arrive at their number, they believe that he's probably 20 years old at the time he took over. Now, David is on his deathbed. David is 70. And so he was a child late in life for David and Bathsheba. But he says he views himself as a little child because he sees being the ruler of this, this kingdom as being a massive job. And we'll get into one of the things that his dad said publicly that probably led him to feel that way. He says, but I'm only a little child. I don't know how to carry out my duties. I don't have the experience. I don't have the knowledge. And quite frankly, I don't have the good judgment that those two would give me to do this job. Therefore, God, I am asking you to gift me that wisdom. Mm. So he says in, in verse 8, your servant is here among the people. You have chosen a great people, too numerous to count or to number. In other words, this is this is a huge job, and I am young and inexperienced, and I don't have the tools to do a very good job with it. So he says, therefore, I'm asking, give your servant a discerning heart. This is so cool. I had never read this this way before. I, I'd often heard of, and actually in the parallel account of this, he says, give your servant uh, wisdom and knowledge. But here, he says, I want you to give me a discerning heart. Mm. And I want to use that discerning heart to do two things. One is to govern your people. 
and two, distinguish between right and wrong. It's interesting he says to distinguish between right and wrong because in the Garden of Eden, uh, God said you could don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of right and wrong, okay? And they did. And yet because of the fall, it became virtually impossible for men to figure out the difference between good and evil. It required great wisdom in order to distinguish. And when you get to this point, it's all about judgment. And you think of our great judges in this country, and you think about how their only goal is to filter through all of the information and determine the truth, mm -hmm. and then to provide justice. And that is exactly what Solomon is asking for here. He says, I want you to give me this discerning heart, this ability to cut through all the noise, to cut through all the information that's right or wrong or, or uh, you know, not uh, true, not perfectly true, and help me to get to the essence of the truth in that. And, uh, from a New Testament perspective, we understand that Jesus said he is the yes. truth. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Who is able to govern this great people of yours? I want you to give me good judgment, he mm -hmm. says. And the parallel verse on this is in Second Chronicles. Remember I said there are four Gospels? Well, there are two books that tell this same story in the history books. The second book is Second Chronicles. It's where he says, give me good judgment, wisdom, and knowledge that I may lead this people for who is able to govern this great people of yours. I like the one that says, give me a discerning heart. Discerning heart. I that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Verse 10, the Lord was pretty happy about this. Uh, Solomon really pleased God with this answer. So God said to him, Solomon, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment. So this, all right, so now God is going to paraphrase back to Solomon what Solomon asked of him. Mm -hmm. So we get it from both directions. We get what we hear, what Solomon says, give me a discerning heart. And then we get a little bit of an embellishment from it when God says it back to him because God understood what Solomon was asking for. So he says it this way. He said, but for discernment and administering justice being a good leader, a good king. Mm. And he says, I'm going to do what you've asked me for. I will give you a wise and a discerning heart. Mm. So that, and look, look how wise and how discerning this heart is going to mm. be. He said, so that well, there will never have been anyone like you in the past, nor will there ever be anyone wow. like you in the future. And we know that there was only one, but he was God in the flesh, Jesus. Jesus. 13, moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for. So it's not only do you get what you did ask for, but because I'm so happy with that, not only are you gonna be the wisest and the most discerning person who's ever lived or ever will live, I'm going to actually grant you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you both wealth and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And it was true. God wow. did that for him. Wow. There was no one as wealthy and no one as, that has as much honor because of his wisdom as Solomon. We remember the Queen of Sheba came and uh, she was a very wise queen too, mm -hmm. but she, he was able to answer all of her questions. She mm -hmm. left amazed. But then he, he puts in a ticking time bomb that we all know blew up in Solomon's face. He says, verse 14, if you walk in obedience to me, keep my decrees and commands as David, your father did, I will give you a long life. Ba-boom, he did not get a long life. Solomon, unlike David, lived to be the age of 60. And oh, by the way, when he was at the age of 60, he was not a happy guy. Then Solomon awoke, verse 15, and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, sacrificed burnt offerings. I don't know what he had left after a thousand, but he, apparently he had something left, and fellowship offerings. Then he had gave a feast for all his court. What a beautiful, beautiful story. What can we today get out of that story? Well, before I get into what we're going to get out of it, let me do a brief summary of what it seems to me happened. First of all, how did Solomon become king? He was not the oldest. 
Amnon was the oldest, but he was killed by Absalom for raping Tamar, okay? And then Absalom took over the throne. He usurped the throne, and he was killed because of that. And that left the only son, older, who was Ad Adonijah. And Adonijah just said, it's got to be me. It's my turn. I'm oldest. So he set himself up. But then Nathan and Bathsheba went to David and said, don't you remember? God told you that Solomon was to be the next king. Mm -hmm. So David says this in 1 Chronicles 28. He says, of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So God chose Solomon. As a matter of fact, when Solomon was born, uh, David and Bathsheba named him Solomon, but uh, God told Nathan that his name was to be the, God, the one who God loves. Aww. So that was kind of cool. Uh, so Solomon was, his name means peaceful, but his other name given by Nathan, uh, given by God to Nathan was the one who God loves. Sounds like John. <laughs> yeah, I know, it, does, it really does. <laughs> So what did David say about Solomon? Now, this is where Solomon probably got the clue about what to ask for. In 1 Chronicles 22, David said, my son Solomon is, now he's talking about building the temple, okay? And he's talking about building the temple. He says, I'm not going to build the temple. God told me that I can't build the temple. I've shed too much blood, but my son Solomon, whose name is peaceful, who's not a warrior, God says he's going to build the temple, but he says this out loud in a speech to people. And Solomon's just sitting there. He's probably a teenager at this time. He said, my son Solomon is what? Young. He's young and inexperienced. And the house to be built, this project that I'm leaving him is massive. Okay. Should be of great magnificence of fame and splendor in the sight of the nations. In other words, I'm giving this kid here who doesn't know much about anything at this point in his life this unbelievably immense project of building God's house. And he goes on to say in the next verses, he says, therefore, because he's young and inexperienced, I'm going to draw up the plans. I'm going to find all the materials. I'm going to source everything. I'm going to leave it ready with plans, detailed numbers, instructions, so that he can build this place. So here's Solomon going... This is not only do I have to be the king of this great nation, I've got this immense project of building God's house. And my dad said, it's going to be a difficult thing for me to do because I'm young and I'm inexperienced. Mm -hmm. I need wisdom. Yes. What does Solomon need? He needed experience. He needed knowledge. And he needed judgment. What did he ask for? He asked for a discerning heart to help him to be a good king, to let, help him tell between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. I think the shadow for us here mm -hmm. is what do we need? What fundamental foundational thing do we as Christians need in order to live a successful Christian life? And I think the answer to that is we need a heart that discerns the heart of God. Mm -hmm. I think once we've got that, once we pray for it, then that God will give us the wisdom that we need to make the decisions day in and day out in this life that will honor and glorify him. So what Solomon asked for, I think, is something that we are to ask for as well. Remember, this story is followed by the story of the two moms. Two ladies had a baby. During the night, one lady rolled over on her baby. The baby died, so she stole the other mother's baby. And then they went to Solomon to find out what to do. And Solomon, well, it's simple. Just take the baby, take the sword, cut the baby in two. And, of course, the real mother said, cry, cried out and said, no, don't do that. And Solomon said, give it to her. She's the real mom. What did that story tell? That story told us that Solomon knew how to get to the truth. Mm. He knew how to discern yes. who the real mother was. That's us. We're told how to discern mm. God's heart. What did God grant? God said, I'll give you a wise and discerning heart. No one before or after you is going to have a more heart more wise, more discerning. But what did he also grant? Great wealth, honor, and a long life. 
if you obey. Mm-hmm. Note, if you, have, <laughs> if you read Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vain. Mm-hmm. You recognize that Solomon, because he went off the path, died at a, what we think of as a young age of 60, and he died as a miserable, miserable man. So what can we conclude from that today? Uh, I'm going to talk to you about two things. One is wisdom versus discernment. So the primacy of godly wisdom, I think, is that of all that Solomon could ask for, he knew that he needed wisdom as the foundation for a successful life. And according to the apostle James, wisdom will be given generously to us if we simply ask God by faith. So it, it's a primary thing for us as Christians. And secondly, we're promised by God that if we ask, if we seek it, mm-hmm. that by faith, he will give it. Wisdom and discernment. Wisdom values accumulated knowledge and experience. There's no question about it. Matter of fact, if you type into Google wisdom, who is the wisest person in the world? First of all, it comes back with Solomon. But the second thing it says, it gives you a list of the most intelligent people in the world. So Google thinks that wisdom and intelligence, IQ, are closely related. My experience is that the smartest people I've ever known are not particularly ones who have a lot of common sense, or I would call that wisdom. Discernment, I think, wisdom values accumulated knowledge. Discernment points to listening beyond words, like Solomon did to the two mothers, down to a lower level, to a more fundamental level of motive and desires. And that's where our discernment needs to go when we're talking to people. Listen to their words, but also understand their motives. Mm. We are limited. Wisdom, our wisdom is definitely going to be limited. We're not going to be as wise as Solomon and definitely not as wise as Christ. And most of us, not as wise as most people. (laughs) Wisdom has therefore a limit based on current knowledge and experience. That's kind of what our wisdom is limited on. The older we get, the more experience and knowledge, but not necessarily the wiser. And discernment has a limit based on being unbiased and impartial. And none of us, unfortunately, reach this place in life being impartial or unbiased. We all have our biases. Godly wisdom, how do we tell? How do we get to the point where we know we've got godly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. And it's the answer comes according to James by the fruit of our lives. Earthly wisdom, if you harbor, James says, bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, he calls this earthly wisdom, doesn't come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual and demonic. So if we harbor in our hearts envy, and ambitious, that ambition that is selfish, then that is coming from experience and knowledge that is worldly. Mm-hmm. Heavenly wisdom, though, he says, comes from pure, is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere peacemakers. That's it's like the fruit of the spirit. Uh, that's right. It's like the fruit <laughs> of the spirit. Those who are peacemakers who sow in peace, they reap a harvest of righteousness, and that is the difference. So godly wisdom number two, the goal. We have to understand that if we're going to seek godly wisdom, we have to seek it through a lens, a perspective. We have to look at our world through God's lens, okay? And what is God's lens when he looks at our world? And the answer is, it's Christ crucified. God has a plan, and he has a plan to bring us back, to bring everyone back, to to anyone who would believe, to restore us, to forgive us. That's the plan, That's the plan, okay? And that plan is through Jesus. And Jesus died so that we can be forgiven and come back. He rose to give us eternal life to be God's children. And that plan, that plan is the wisdom of God. And that plan is how we view everything on this earth in our lives through that plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, Christ crucified... He's a stumbling block to the Jews and he's foolishness to the Gentiles. But he, to us, he is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. Where is the wise person? He's talking about earthly wisdom here. Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Where is the IQ people? Where are the really smart folks? And the answer is, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
First Timothy says this, wisdom, true wisdom, has a source. Unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Solomon asked for a discerning heart because he knew without it he could never do what God wanted him to do. We need to make the same request. Pray with me. Father God, our number one prayer today is for a discerning heart, a heart that is not biased, that is not filled with earthly desires, but it is pure. A heart that wants to discern the truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he rose again so that we can be with you forever. Father, give us a discerning heart about every decision that we make, yes. every person that we see. Let us listen beyond the words to find motive and to find desire. Because, Father, the ultimate motive and the ultimate desire is to know you. So let us look beyond the words and let us give the answer that will be salvation. For it's in Jesus' name we can pray it. Amen. Amen. That's a good I love You like that lesson? Love right. lesson? Be wise mm. like Solomon. Mm. I got a better idea. Be wise like Christ. Amen. Until we do this again next week, mm -hmm. be safe and be healthy. We love you. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.